Disturbing rumor turned out to be true at your school. When I was a senior in high school, we had a new teacher join the faculty to teach health and home economics. She was probably about 26 years old and very very attractive. Everyone was talking about the hot new teacher. As I was senior class president, I needed a new faculty advisor since my previous advisor of three years retired at the end of my junior year. About two weeks later the principal called me into his office and informed me that the new hot teacher was going to be our new class advisor for the rest of the year. As a result, she and I spent a lot of time together, at school and off campus, organizing and running myriad events to raise money for the class, plan the prom, field trips etc. Soon, the rumors started flying around that she and I were messing around. This was completely false. I can say she never acted inappropriately towards me or suggested anything to make me think she had plans for any type of physical or sexual activity. She was a fantastic advisor and always just that, a class advisor. I spent the rest of the year denying these rumors with friends, with teachers and with parents. I was even interrogated by my wrestling coach the day before the district championship match. She and I had a laugh about it at graduation as she had to face similar questions from other faculty as well as the principal. She confided in me that she had tendered her resignation but the principal would not accept it and said he believed her and would ensure the rumor was squashed. So I graduated and left for my plebe year at West Point forgetting about the entire situation. At West Point the first year is called plebe year rather than freshman year. The first semester of my plebe year was moving along as it should with no unusual events worth mentioning until the final month. Then, in early December, the topic of my high school faculty advisor resurfaced. One night when I was studying, there was a knock on my door and the company tactical officer, a regular army captain, walked in and told me to report to his office immediately as there was a phone call for me from the Dover Police Department. Now, I immediately assumed it was my brother playing some kind of twisted joke on me since he was a captain in the very same police department waiting for me on the phone. Since my tack was standing right behind me, I answered the phone as we were taught, Cadet Kerwick speaking, how may I help you sir slash ma'am? I immediately recognized the voice on the other end. It was not my brother but a close friend I had grown up with and known for over 15 years. He said, Humans stopped being predators? Watch their kids play. I was eating the evening meal with several friends after my return from Earth or Terra as it was often called. The humans were still somewhat new to the galactic stage, but were quickly making a name for themselves as one of the few species that started as a predator but didn't seem to desire war with everyone or really anyone for that matter. They freely admitted to the horrors they inflicted upon each other in the past but proudly proclaimed they had grown beyond that. So what do humans eat? My friend Xa asked. It would be easier to tell you what they don't eat. I answered. I've seen them eat plants and animals they knew were toxic. Some loved to eat plants that caused burning sensations, some smoked plants that cause cell mutations, and most drink substances that harm their brains. But generally they'll eat any plant or animal though individual preference very wildly. So they evolved as predators but they eat plants, even toxic ones? Says life matels asked. Not exactly, they're quite the omnivore. I studied their evolution and they've been a herbivore, a scavenger, and it was later that they started hunting. But yes they love toxic plants. Some for their burning sensations, some as stimulants, and some for a type of cooling sensation. While on Terra I was invited to what humans call a barbecue. A most interesting gathering. After studying their evolution I can see how the barbecue is a ritual that has endured. It's not too alien for many of our group ingestion rituals. I explained, this elicited some strange looks from around the table but soon everyone's eyes have the same message, explain this. Consider us now, we're gathered here at this place that happens to be my favorite nutrient ingestion place to celebrate my return from Terra. Humans tend to gather and celebrate many or any occasion by consuming nutrients together. The barbecue was held in my honor since I was departing soon. But looking back at human history when they started hunting, they didn't have speed or strength on their side. They had two things, two things that don't seem that great. They can dissipate heat faster than any other species on their planet, actually more than any other known life form today. So they would often chase down their prey until its muscles gave out. They could do this for over half of their day, longer as they often worked in teams. Then they could carry it back to where they're dwelling. That alone gave them some initial success. What really gave them their next edge is their ability to throw things accurately. I stated, what did they throw, rocks? Asked Nilf my supervisor that suggested I take this assignment. Initially yes, but soon they learned how to use rocks to sharpen or make spears which they would throw. This allowed them to run less. So the basis of humanity's ascent was running and throwing. Next they would drag their kill back so their family group could eat it. Later on they harnessed fire which made this easier and safer. The table was quiet for a minute as they contemplated this. Us Sincerians evolved by hiding from our world's predators. Eventually we learned to make tools and fortifications to keep them at bay but we never really engaged them. Agriculture was our first major breakthrough. As was most other species in known space. Most predatory species learned to hunt and never gave it up. Which is why most of them were behind a heavily enforced quarantine but not humans, we were wary at first having met ambush predators in our past as well as current galactic past but they seemed honest in their desire to join the greater community. They were quickly integrating themselves as merchants, soldiers, engineers, and really every other role you could imagine. I had to admit it was odd during a standby period on my transit home to see humans offering themselves as pleasure companions. Well I'm glad they've given up hunting and predation. 
So stated, I paused considering my next statement. I don't think they fully have. I think it's genetic for them. Take this barbecue. The food available was of a very wide variety. Like us, many humans enjoy salads and they had a few of them available. The lettuce type was certainly my favorite but they also had one with potatoes which are these amazing roots, I think. Also several other salads including something they called macaroni, but the main dish that the humans were there for was a wild animal. My host had recently terminated what he called a wild boar that was considered to be an invasive animal to his area. So he invited his family group, people that lived in close proximity to him, his co-workers, and myself. I was what he called the guest of honor. A lot of these people also brought their offspring. Ah, so the adults still hunt. Did he chase down this wild boar? Asked Nilf. No, he used a very primitive slug thrower. I asked if his people still chase down prey and he said in some areas they do, but he had accumulated too much age and mass to do so. He preferred to hide in a tree with his slug thrower. But what really convinced me that humans are still predators of their offspring. You see they quickly organized a number of games and a lot of them didn't have familiarity with each other. The younger ones had the most simple games, they would chase each other. When one was caught they would simply start chasing another. Also they had games that involved throwing things. They tended to prefer throwing spheres or oblate spheroids but great emphasis was placed on accuracy in throwing and catching. When I asked my host about this he said something about being joyful that the offspring were doing something to exert themselves rather than using electronic devices. When I asked further about the rules of these games he seemed confused. He said with. Hag one does not desire to be it and can only remove this condition by being fast enough to contact someone else and proclaim that they are now it. He didn't claim to know what the rules of every throwing game was but he was quite proud of the older offspring running what he called passes. Wait. So their offspring instinctively hunt each other? It seems if they're playing tag the best strategy would be to hide. So stated. I realized that this would take a lot of time to explain though I was pleased at more social meetings that would be needed to do this. Their offspring have a game for that, they called it hide and go seek. When I asked about how they transitioned to it from tag, again my host said tag tends to turn into it when the first person tries to hide. So you see, they became such successful predators because their earliest recreation is a form of war gaming the predator slash prey relationship. Again the table was silent. I also noticed that some tables near us had ceased their conversations. I think we should keep them off our planet, a patron of another table said. This was met with murmurs of approval. While I was no great expert of humanity or Terra I did feel a need to defend my friends. So I stood to address those near me. Humanity can seem terrifying, but their history both ancient and modern is filled with countless examples of them risking everything and even terminating themselves to save not only each other but other animals on their world. I would tremble in fear of having them as an enemy. But when I was there I slept better knowing them as friends. I was met with approval but I felt humanity would be best if they were slowly introduced on my world. Many of them expressed a desire to visit even though it is very tame compared to Terra. My thoughts were interrupted as our meal was presented to us. Conversation at our table quickly went back to humans. My friends were speculating at how they survived let alone thrived on a world filled with other predators. I felt it would be best to save the history of how they turned one of their greatest rival predators into what they call their best friend. Ass shooting survivors, what is your story? It was the summer of 2012. My longtime boyfriend and I had recently gotten married. Even though we were dirt poor college students and lived in a dinky apartment, we were having a blast. That particular summer we gathered with our friends at the local movie theater almost every weekend. There was one just down the street from our apartment that had really cheap movie tickets. On Thursday night, I received a call from this group of friends inviting us to watch the midnight premiere of the newest Batman movie. Certainly it wouldn't do any harm to stay up later than usual and miss a few hours of sleep, right? At 10.30 p.m. we met at the theater. Being paranoid that the tickets would sell out quickly, one of my friends swung by earlier that day and purchased tickets for all of us. We bypassed the ticket line and went straight to the ticket taker. She smiled at us and kindly directed us to Theater 9, which was on the right side of the lobby. The screen was motionless and gray, not even the previews had started yet because there was still a good hour and a half to go until the movie actually started. I was surprised at just how packed the theater already was. Just about every seat was filled, much to our dismay. Luckily, one of my friends then spotted a row with five empty seats all next to each other, perfect for the number of people we had. We ran up the stairs before someone could take the seats and filed in. My husband sat in the fifth seat. I sat next to him and my friend Samantha sat next to me on my right side. Her boyfriend, Tommy, sat next to her, and another friend named Leo sat in the Oz seat. We spent the next several minutes casually chatting, joking around, and laughing. After a while, my three friends went to the lobby to buy drinks and that addicting movie theater popcorn. When the movie started the theater erupted into cheering and clapping. The title of the movie, The Dark Knight Rises, exploded onto the screen. This was followed by the scene where Bane is hijacking a plane, I thought this scene was pretty cool and it caught my interest right away. Only when the movie started to get a little less interesting did I remember just how tired I was. I decided I would close my eyes at the more boring parts to get a little bit of rest. Bang! The sound erupted from the left side of the theater. I sort of screamed a little because it startled me. A strange smell started to fill the auditorium. It was like the smell of a firework, so I thought it was a cherry bomb or something similar. 
Had someone thrown fireworks into the crowd as a prank? Then, down near the right side of the movie screen, the dark silhouette of a person caught my attention. They were just a black frame against the bright movie screen. A series of flashing lights were coming from this person. It was a weird moment where time literally slowed down and everything went strangely quiet. I was completely frozen, unable to move, and really unable to think at all. It was like my brain had stopped working entirely. My husband caught on immediately to what was happening and he grabbed me. He pulled me to the ground and lay on top of me, shielding me with his own body. At this point, time and sound returned to me. I could hear the gunshots ringing out across the theater. People were screaming. The movie was still playing on top of it all, creating a chaotic explosion of sound. An instant sensation of adrenaline flooded my body. There was absolutely nothing I could do except lay there and hope to God that the bullets I heard ripping through seats and walls wouldn't go through me, too. At one point shrapnel hit my head, cutting off a good chunk of my hair, and as I reached for the spot to make sure it wasn't bleeding, hot pieces of metal fell into my hand. I was lying face up, so I could see everything that was happening. The lights from a still playing movie danced across the ceiling and walls. My friends were on the floor with me. Our unfinished bucket of popcorn was spilled all across the floor. Leo had his legs sticking out into the aisle because there wasn't enough room for him to hide completely behind the seats. At some point, Samantha's water bottle, which had been in the cup holder between our seats, exploded. Water splashed all over my face. The smell of gun smoke was overwhelming. Riot grade tear gas made me cry and caused me to cough uncontrollably. There was another smell, too, the horrible metallic smell of blood that I'll never forget. I remember my lower body feeling wet all of a sudden. For some reason, I thought this came from the leaking water bottle, but I soon realized this wasn't the case. All of a sudden things went strangely quiet. The bullets had stopped for some reason. Tommy shouted, let's get out of here. We took advantage of the opportunity and made a run for it. We ran down the stairs, across the front of the screen towards a bright green exit sign. We crammed into a small, closet-like space where the door was. It was so dark we had a hard time finding it. We were screaming and slamming on the walls to find the door, blinded by the tear gas and dumbfounded by shock. Then, finally, my hands felt the metal door handle and I pushed against it with all my strength. The door flew open and the light of a nearby streetlight flooded our eyes. We pushed against the door so hard that we all fell over onto the concrete. Samantha lost her pink flip-flops just outside this doorway. As I scrambled to my feet and literally ran for my life, I realized my legs were red, absolutely soaked with blood. It was like I dipped my legs into a bathtub full of it. I checked my body all over and realized I wasn't injured at all. Where had this blood come from? I looked behind me and realized that the blood was my husband's. He had been shot in the leg. A massive, gaping hole had ripped through the lower half of his right leg. His foot was barely hanging on and dangled lifelessly. Leo and a young man I didn't recognize were carrying my husband because, after falling outside the door, he lost all his strength and he couldn't walk. I was completely shocked. I had no idea he had been injured, especially since he was right behind me the whole time and managed to escape the theater all by himself. At this point, I screamed. My scream was so loud that it alerted nearby construction workers. At the back of the theater, there was a narrow parking lot, followed by a grassy lawn and then the street beyond that. The construction workers were doing road repair on this street, but as soon as they heard my scream and saw us running, they stopped working and watched what was going on. I'm not sure why this is such a vivid part of my memory. Anyway, they carried my husband along the back sidewalk all the way to the end, where the corner of the building is. This was quite a distance, several dozen feet. My husband then collapsed from exhaustion and pain, saying he couldn't move anymore. He lay down and a puddle of blood started to form beneath him. I looked back and realized we had left a trail of blood leading from the door all the way to our current position. I was trembling. I knelt beside him and glanced around to see who else was injured. Tommy had been shot in the knee and the hip, and was further away in the parking lot. The teenager who helped my husband was also injured. His dad and mom were with him, his mom was sitting against the wall and looked like she was going to pass out. She was bleeding from several places. That family escaped at the same time we did. I guess they heard the bullets stop and decided to make a run for it, too. We were all lucky because the shooting was still going on inside. I had to take off my shirt and use it to stop the bleeding. I'll never forget how lifeless and limp his leg felt, and I imagine that's what a dead body must feel like. I got blood all over my hands and arms. The police showed up really, really fast. I'd say we were only outside for a minute or two before the red and blue sirens filled the night and rushed to our location. A female officer stood by us the whole time until paramedics arrived, which took a very long time. My husband was one of the last to be taken to a hospital. He was bleeding out for almost 20 minutes before an ambulance pulled up on the same street with the road work. At this point, he had become almost unresponsive and was on the verge of unconsciousness. Several massive guys rushed across the grass with a stretcher, loaded him onto it, and then ran with him back to the waiting ambulance. I wasn't able to go with him because there was another injured person in the ambulance, and it was too crowded. I wandered around to the front of the theater alone, unsure of where my friends had gone. 
My bloodstained shirt and a pool of blood were left behind on the corner of that sidewalk. Walking through the crowds felt like a dream. I couldn't believe what just happened. People were in hysterics and crying. A lot of people such as me were covered in blood. And, like me, I'm pretty sure the blood staining their skin and clothes wasn't their own. A lot of people seemed to notice how lonely and dazed I looked, so they kept me company and even offered me a ride to different hospitals to find my husband because I hadn't been told what hospital he was taken to. I hung around these people for a while as police swarmed the area and asked us what we saw inside the theater. The whole parking lot was on lockdown, and we weren't going to be allowed to leave anytime soon. It was around 2 a.m., so it was very dark outside. The flashing red and blue lights of what seemed like 100 police cars were blinding. I started to get sick to my stomach and wanted to vomit, but somehow I was able to hold it back. Eventually, the police started letting people leave. I jumped into my truck and booked it out of there. I was in such a panic that I didn't even think to go back to my apartment, grab my cell phone which I had forgotten, and call my parents or someone else to help me. I was angry, upset, scared, and most of all still in a state of shock. Was I really going to lose my Brock only a month shy of our first wedding anniversary because of some psychopath? By the time dawn rolled around, I found the hospital he was treated in. This was in the next city over, maybe 45 minutes from the theater if you're going the speed limit. I was so happy to be there, and the hospital staff were also welcoming and understanding. After making sure I wasn't injured as well, they let me wait in the ICU room that my husband would be placed in when he was done recovering from surgery. I was so glad he was alive. Brock and Tommy both had survived, though many others weren't so lucky. I found out the following day that 12 people passed and over 70 were injured. We'll keep this secret to my grave veiled, this has got to be the most embarrassing thing that has ever happened to me, yet I'm the only one who knows it happened. I've never told a soul, but it's something I have been dying to share with someone and I am too embarrassed to even say it out loud, so why not do it here anonymously? Praying this does not go viral lol, I won't be giving any names because honestly I feel that if the people in this story ever came across this post they would know exactly who I am. So, I'll just start with a little context. At one point in my life, I rented a spare bedroom in my best friend's parents' home. It was a three-bedroom house, her parents shared one, while she and her partner shared the second, and I of course had the third. This house only had one bathroom, which never really seemed to be a problem for me as I was always either working or out and about. Unfortunately, one night my luck ran out. It was about 4 a.m., and I woke up with my stomach on fire. I went to use the bathroom thinking it would be free because who the hell is up using the bathroom at that time, right? Turns out it's occupied by her dad, and I was not about to knock no matter how much of an emergency it was. I turned back to my room and I'm sitting on my bed, legs literally shaking. I thought he'd be out soon. I went from legs shaking to now pacing my room. Mind you, my stomach has now been burning for the past 15 minutes. I went to check again, it's silent, but he's still in there. I go back to my room and continue pacing. At this point, I'm looking around to see what I can use or where I could go. I'm becoming desperate. I thought about finding a spot in the backyard, but there were dogs that I knew would be too noisy jumping all over me and I didn't want to be caught mid-crap at 4am by her dad. I kept thinking and thinking like why do I do? It's now been well over 20 minutes and he's still in the bathroom. I make a desperate decision to quietly walk out the front door and look to see if there was a spot I could hide to relieve myself from this hell. I look out into the street, it's dark and scary and this wasn't the greatest neighborhood so I decided to go behind a porch swing they had placed in the corner of their yard. I practically ran over pulling my PJs down as I go because I knew once I got there I wouldn't have a second to spare. When I tell you I have never felt such relief in my life, my god. Once I finished I cleaned myself up, yes I took some paper towels with me, and decided I would water it down with the hose in a couple of hours as I'm leaving for work. The last thing I wanted was for her dad to come out of the bathroom and hear the water running and find me watering his grass at 4am like some kind of spun out weirdo. I went back to bed and when it came time for me to leave for work, you guessed it, I forgot, I went to work without a care in the world, and then it hit me, I thought about it the entire freaking day, hoping and praying that no one had noticed, I kept thinking the moment I got home I would immediately spray it down and it would be over, no one would ever know, I finally arrive home from work, it's already a little past 6pm, I walk over to where I left the crime scene, it was gone, mortified, I walk straight to my room, luckily, no one was in the living room so I didn't even have to see anyone as I did my walk of shame, a few hours go by, and I get a text asking if I'd like to join a smoke sesh with my best friend and her partner. I go out to meet them on the front porch and sit on the bench next to my best friend. They're acting completely normal. We're all talking and passing this joint when all of a sudden she says, OMG, guess what happened today? My heart dropped, I instantly knew what she was going to say, but really no I didn't because what came out of her mouth next I never would have imagined lol. She then tells me that she and her partner had gone out to smoke on the porch swing in the front yard earlier in the day, yes. That porch swing. She tells me that as they are smoking she is playing fetch with her dog, the dog was obsessed with squeaky toys. She got lost in conversation with her partner when she realized she hadn't seen her pup in a little while, so she starts calling her name. She looks behind the swing, and as she locked eyes on her, her dog was smelling something and before she could yell at her to get her away from it, her dog proceeds to roll in IT. She flipped out and grabbed her as quickly as she could while her partner runs to grab the water hose to spray her down. Then her partner says, dude something took a poop in our yard, and that poop did not smell like dog poop, 
It smelled like human poop. They both continued to explain to me how horrible and disgusting it smelled while I sat there with the best poker face I could make, I was dying inside. Then she says once he started to spray the dog down, it got all over her arms, while also making the hand gestures of how covered her arms were in my poop, omg. I'm dead on the inside at this point, trying so hard not to make any suspicious expressions. They both kept saying how they have no idea what animal could have made a poop like that, all the while I sat there knowing the animal was me. It's been a few years since this has happened, and I don't think I could ever bring myself to tell her the truth. I will probably take this to my grave, but now it's off my chest. I disowned my son for being gay and it was the best decision of my life. My ex-wife and I had our son right out of high school, we were both 19 at the time and decided to keep it and a year after his birth we got married, I won't get too much into the details but his mother and I had a rough marriage and by 24 we were both divorced and moved on with our lives, I've had primary care of our son throughout his life while she has had a lot of visitation and had him stay with her at various lengths. All throughout his life my son has had a rebellious streak, from trouble at school, lying to teachers, stealing, bullying, missing classes, you name it he's done it at some point, we tried therapy sessions but they never came to anything and he wouldn't show up for them, we've been in and out of court for stupid petty theft and other idiotic things he's done. This streak also continued at home, though at his mother's he always manipulated her and presented himself as a victim, so her and I would butt heads from time to time as he often blamed me, I tried to do things with him all his life, put him into extracurriculars, spend time with him, be interested in his hobbies but no matter what I've tried he's always lashed out and pushed back on me, I've gone to therapy myself and nothing worked. He was always ungrateful to anything I did, he wanted to join dance class, I got him enrolled in a class I could afford on my salary, he would then tell me I'm abusive because I wouldn't put him in the more expensive ones, he wanted to drive, I bought him a car and taught him, but his car was crappy and embarrassing, the clothes I bought, same thing, no matter how hard I've ever tried nothing has been good enough for him. On top of that he's stolen from me, lied to me on numerous occasions, spread lies and rumors to his mom, teachers and friends about my supposed horrible treatment of him, he's 19 years old and blames me for every little thing that ever goes wrong in his life and his mother always echoes it. Well six months ago it reached a boiling point, he asked me if he could borrow my car to go do something, I told him no because I had to go to the office late to get things ready for the morning, while I was in the shower he stole the keys to my car, he refused to answer my calls all night, in the morning a random vehicle dropped him off and I asked where my car was, he told me to F off, he had obviously been drinking, and went to sleep, when he woke up I found out that he had gotten into a wreck with it, hitting a parked vehicle, and rode off my car and the other one, on top of the insurance cost, raise an insurance after the collision, I also had to pay a towing fee for my now destroyed car, we got into a huge argument where he let me know everything he thought about me and what a horrible piece of shite dad I am, it ended with me kicking him out and I'm going to stay with his mother. After two days of radio silence I get a nasty text from his mom, apparently what he told her what happened is that he came out to me and that I blew up and kicked him out for being gay, I was pissed, not because he was gay, that much had been obvious since he hit puberty if not even earlier even though he never brought it up to me, just the sheer victim lying bullcrap he had done his entire life hit me. I didn't reply for a day after a steady stream of more abusive messages and his mom calling me a monster, piece of shite, abusive a-hole, etc., and informed me that she called my work and let them know what a homophobe I am, something in me in that last one just made my last bit of empathy snap. For the record, I am not homophobic, having even had a gay experience myself in high school, but something in me just snapped, I wrote back confirming what he said to her as true and how I couldn't morally accept him back into my house and that I was essentially disowning him, how him being gay just wasn't something I could overcome, I was just sick of defending myself from his relentless bull crap and it felt freeing, my texts got put online by both him and my wife and spread like wildfire on my social media and I've lost some friends and family, while gaining others secret support, it was rough for a bit but even with that public crucifixion I feel happy, like I can breath again. He sent me messages and tried calling me but I just reiterated what I said to his mother that I didn't agree with his new lifestyle and I figured it could be another thing he could be a victim about, and he could stay angry at me and just stay out of my life for good, after a while he just stopped trying. My boss pulled me aside to talk to me and he congratulated on taking a stand against degeneracy and that my job wasn't a jeopardy, I was also forced to sit through some Bible-thumping conservative rant about the state of the world but he couldn't say anything about it because of snowflakes or some shite, after that he's been really nice to me, even giving me a better position in the company with a pay raise, I plan to use my new position to negotiate a good salary at a new company, I'm not going to stay working for someone with these crappy values and opinions, plus he won't stop inviting me to dumb events. All in all things couldn't have worked out better for me, I will remain a closeted LGBTQ supporter and my son can stay the heck away from me and spread his narrative of how I kicked him out for being gay, sorry for the long post, I had a lot more I could have added but it was already a lot, how do you summarize a child's entire life? My family for revenge PRN, you won't believe what we did to him, so this all started about 3 years ago, my cousin who lives in Arizona always had a desire to have professional nude photos taken, she thought it'd be nice to have something for her husband to look at from when she was in her prime as they aged together, also I think it kinda turned her on. However my cousin had no desire to have those photos publicly published. After a few years of chewing on this idea, she decided she was going to do it. She went out looking for a photographer. She had a tight budget and ended up going with this one man who quoted her $300 for a one-hour photo shoot. He didn't mind taking nude pictures of her. 
however she asked him if he had any agreement or something that would keep those photos confidential, he said he did not, she asked him if she wrote up an agreement basically stating the photos he takes of her cannot be saved on any of his devices, and the SD card needs to be given to her and that she should be the only person with a copy of the photos and if he'd agree to that. His only request was that she buy the SD card herself, so she agreed, he sent her what kind of SD card she should buy and she bought it. She also wrote up an agreement in which the following was agreed upon and signed. Photo shoot was to last one hour he would be paid $300 he would edit six pictures of her choosing, airbrushing slash making her look better etc. He would also print those six photos she would supply the SD card. He would also delete any photos of her from any device he has the photos he takes of her. After he's done should not be saved to any device he owns, and the only copy should be on the SD card when he gives her the SD card. He not allowed to share those photos with anyone for any reason and those photos belong to her only. Agreement was signed, photo shoot happened, photos were edited, she got her SD card. All things well and good my cousin figured that was that. Obviously we all know this isn't the end, but just the start otherwise I wouldn't be posting here. About 6 months after the photo shoot the photographer contacts her and says he has copies of her photos and knows a website can he sell them too for $500 and if she doesn't want that she needs to pay him $500. My cousin calls me and asks me what I think she should do as I'm pretty good at handling dynamic situations. I did some googling and come to find out, this could be considered revenge corn and that's illegal in the state of Arizona. In fact, it's a felony which means jail time. Also obviously this would be considered blackmail which is also a felony. So I tell my cousin to do this, don't pay him, if you pay him once there is nothing stopping him from trying to get you to pay again remind him that you are both in the state of Arizona and that it's a felony to distribute revenge corn. Remind him that you had a signed agreement in which he agreed the photos he took of her he would not save a copy and he would never publish anywhere remind him if he publishes your photos, you will post him on blast throughout the social media world. She said, thanks, I thought this was the end of that story. But about 6 months later I'm on Reddit, on my corn Reddit account, I have a Reddit account I only use to subscribe to corn subreddits to keep my main account clear of corn, and I'm whacking off, and I'm in one of the subs when I click on a picture and bam my weenie goes limp. I'm staring at my cousin in a very seductive pose, I knew she was my cousin cause you could see the tattoo of her son's name and birthday. It was a complicated feeling, at first I was annoyed that my whack of session was ruined by running across a picture of my cousin, and then it dawned on me, the photographer didn't listen to her and must have published her photos anyway. So now things get more awkward cause now I have to call my cousin and tell her how I found her nude photos as I was masturbating. Not a conversation anyone would like to have with a blood relative but, she had to know. So I called my cousin and informed her of what I saw, I sent her the links, I went to the local Facebook groups, and left nasty reviews for him. My cousin didn't want her name out there saying nude photos have her existed so people could go out and find them. I then googled how to DMCA and sent in DMCA notices to the sites I could find that were hosting her photos. I also did a reverse image search and DMCA those as well. I taught my cousin how to do this herself. FYI DMCA works, and none of the sites even argued with us. At this point someone PMs me an attorney's number. They tell me this attorney was an advisor to the revenge corn law bill that Arizona passed and that we should call the attorney. So I did, I explained the story to the attorney, I left out the my whacking a bit as I didn't feel that was relevant. The attorney then explained to me because I wasn't the victim he couldn't really do anything until the victim contacted him, herself. So I went to my cousin, told her about this attorney and how she should go speak to the attorney. Now my cousin has a flaw in her personality, she's very quick to forgive. I tried my best to persuade her but she said she felt the nasty reviews we had left and spreading the news was enough. Another 6 months pass and one day my cousin calls me again and says you wouldn't believe which son of a bitch emailed me being the quick thinker I am I said the photographer right? She said yep and I said so how much money is he asking for now? She said he's asking for $10,000 to delete her photos and his compensation for the damages we caused to his business. Apparently people don't want to hire a photographer who publishes people's photographs that they paid him to take without their permission. I told it was time to call the attorney. She agreed let's skip ahead a year. Apparently said photographer had plenty of money to fight a legal battle long end of the story my cousin got him convicted for blackmail, and revenge corn plus successfully sued him and got a civil judgment for a hefty sum of money. He's currently serving 3 years in an Arizona state prison. Granted after she got her civil judgment he had basically sold everything he had trying to stay out of jail so it's unlikely she will ever be able to collect, but basically his future earnings now belong to her as I understand it. The most disturbing thing you've read in someone's diary, after what I found out, I'm never going to snoop around other people's stuff again. When I was 13, my friend, Rachel, invited me and a couple of my other friends to her house for a sleepover. Rachel was like the celebrity of the school, and spending time with her would have done wonders for my reputation at school, so of course I couldn't decline her invitation. Plans were made and it was decided that I would come over on a Friday night. On a Friday night, I arrive at her house, and two of the other girls are already there. I come in, Rachel takes us to her room, and we lie down on the floor and gossip and talk about celebrities and school drama and other trivial things. It's going good so far, nothing's amiss. We watched YouTube videos together and went to bed at 2am. Later in the night, I woke up because of thirst and headed to the kitchen for a beverage. Before leaving the room, I decided to mess with Rachel. A few days ago, at school, she stole my pencil case from my bag. As an art student, it was my life. She stole it and ruined some of its contents. That really pissed me the FCK off. She barely even said sorry. So now, I was in her room, she was sleeping, 
and I had a fantastic opportunity to take revenge. There was a drawer next to her bed, and using the light of my phone, I searched it for anything that I could tease Rachel about. After minutes of exploring, I found a very decorated and pretty diary, but it had a lock on it. No problem, I knew some lock picking and a diary's lock usually isn't as strong as other locks. So I took my hairpin off my head and tried to crack it. I was successful. If she had to lock her diary, there was definitely something written in there that she didn't want others to see. Ah, all of her secrets in my hands. I went outside the room, into the kitchen, grabbed a drink from the fridge, sat down on the floor and began reading the diary with the help of my phone's light. In the first few entries, she wrote about the things she wanted to do to me. These included kidnapping me, hurting me, and other gnarly things. She described in great detail how she would do each of these. I was so horrified. Yes, there was some hostility between me and her, but I never knew she carried such a strong hatred for me. The next entries were about her life. She wrote about how her stepdad has been forcing relations with her whenever her mom wasn't around, how he manipulates her and makes her think that she deserves to be abused, and how he has been doing this since she was nine. She also wrote that, to get the fury, the frustration out of her, she abuses small animals. She wrote that she once dissected a living baby hamster with knives, stomped on a kitten's head until its face was unrecognizable, unalived a turtle by repeatedly dropping a large rock on it, etc. There were loads of other things written in there that were too much for a 13-year-old. I felt outrageously angry at her but also had sympathy for her at the same time. I cried a little. I also felt scared. Maybe she invited me to her house just to unalive me, and then do all those things to me that she said she would? I went back into the room, put the diary back in the drawer, and didn't sleep that night because I felt like there was a good chance she would wake up and suffocate me to death in my sleep with a blanket or a pillow or something. I kept watching her carefully all night. Whenever she moved I shivered. Thankfully, she didn't wake up. In the morning, at around 7 a.m., before she and the other girls woke up, I grabbed the diary from the drawer, went out to the living room, and found her mom sitting on the couch, using a laptop. I walked up to her and gave her the diary. I know I invaded Rachel's privacy, but her mom had to know everything that was up with her daughter. She thanked me, called my mom, and I went home. In school on the subsequent Monday, I saw Rachel in the locker area, and she saw me, and as soon as we saw each other, she took out a dagger from her pocket and charged at me. I was stabbed once in the stomach, but several students and a teacher stopped her and got her away from me before she could stab me more. My memory is not clear at this point, because I fainted, but I remember waking up in my bedroom. I was passed out for days, and fortunately recovered. I never saw Rachel again after that incident, and have no idea where she is now, but I hope that she got the help she was in terrible need of. Did you find while snooping that you wish you had never found? Several years ago my teenage daughter, 13 at the time, had some problems with staying up really late and then it was almost impossible to get her up in the morning, the major reason being she was on her phone and social media with friends until all hours. I felt it was getting out of hand so after 11 p.m. she had to hand her phone over to me and I'd give it back to her in the morning. Normally, I'd throw her phone in a drawer and give it back to her the next morning, but for some reason one night I had it on my dresser. Around midnight it started buzzing repeatedly with texts. I got up to put it in the dresser so I wouldn't hear it, but as I looked at the screen I saw a bunch of texts had come in from her older sister who was away at college. My cell was downstairs in my purse and I thought maybe something was wrong and that's why she was repeatedly texting her younger sibling. In any case, I opened the most recent text. It turned out to be a text where she was telling my youngest daughter how much she hated me. I know I should have just shut it down and put it back, but I couldn't believe my eyes and went on to read other texts between them. The texts mainly talked about how upset they were with me and what a bad mom they felt I was. Main reasons were I checked up on their grades when they were in high school and limited cell phone. Usage. My feelings were so hurt. Initially I didn't say anything to my daughters or husband because I knew I was wrong to have checked her phone. This happened a week or two before Mother's Day. In any case, as Mother's Day approached my husband wanted to know what I wanted to do. He was trying to organize something with the girls for me but I kept shutting it down. I felt it would be so hypocritical for us to do something together because my daughters really didn't want to be with me anyways. I was so angry and hurt and I didn't want to say or do anything that might make the situation worse. In any case, I finally told my husband what had happened and why I felt the way I did. We had a huge fight about it and he felt that I had violated their privacy. I admitted to my daughters about what I had done too and expressed my regret about doing it. I told them I was sorry. My oldest proceeded to call me names I'd never heard before and told me about all the ways I had ruined her and her sister's lives. She threatened to tell my friends and co-workers that I was a child abuser. The relationships I had with my daughters and husband were irrevocably changed because of that event. I had always been the prime disciplinarian in our family. My husband always wanted to be the girl's friend, he hated the hard part of parenting. After that I cut back on disciplining my youngest and asked my husband to step up more with things. He resents me for it. It's definitely put a wedge between us. He also put a lock on his cell phone so no one can get into or see his messages but him. My oldest and I have mended fences somewhat. But we really aren't that close. When she needs or wants something she'll reach out to me at times, but her father is usually her preferred first choice. And my youngest, she is emotionally aloof, I constantly tell her how proud I am of her and that I love her but she rarely if ever responds. It's been almost five years since the incident. When my father died last year it was one of the few times she said she loved me. I'm not sure if it was sincere or she just felt she had to say it. In conclusion, I often wish I had never found those text messages while snooping.
I thought we had a strong family that loved each other but I now realize we only have tolerated each other, perhaps the old saying ignorance is bliss is true, it certainly would have seemed so in my case. What's the most unhinged revenge you've ever gotten? When I was just out of middle school and my sister was still in elementary, my dad met his third wife at the only gas station in our town. They soon moved in together, and my dad abandoned us in our basement apartment to live on a shanty houseboat with her. He would show up every other week and give me $40 for groceries. Eventually, someone figured out the situation and called my mom. We went to live with her which was, believe it or not, worse. My dad and his shanty wife got married in 1991. Not long after, she called me and told me my dad's brain tumor had returned and that he couldn't handle the stress of being around us. That the only people he could bear to be around was her, and her son, Shorty, who was my age. When I called my dad to ask if this was true, he said it wasn't, and he just couldn't believe that she would say that to begin with. That was our last conversation for many years. In the meanwhile, I worked my way through college, living in my car from time to time. My dad and I were no contact, but I heard from family that he bought a house and put his son through some vocational classes. When my grandmother died, Shorty and Shanty wife showed up in a truck and took all the furniture and anything else that wasn't tied down or already gone. Eventually, I went no contact with my dad's side of the family. I struggled for years, decades really, but I made it. And I have a great job and a good family now. The best revenge is living well, right? Two years ago. I got a call from my dad's brother, Alan. He told me my dad was in a nursing home in another state and I needed to go see him because he needed my help. Shorty had ghosted him. The nursing home, coincidentally, was about 20 minutes from my house. And I saw an opportunity and I went. The reunion was underwhelming. I didn't want to make amends, but I did want to hear how he wound up dumped and all alone in another state. And it was a really, really good story. Shanty wife got lung cancer and put my dad in a nursing home before she died in 2017. She suffered, and I was happy to hear it. Shorty became his power of attorney when she died, and had been visiting my dad, living in my dad's house with his two children, and taking care of my dad's affairs since his mom died. But now he was MIA, and my dad was worried about him. He asked me to drive the hour and a half to his house to check on everything. That's all he wanted. He never even asked me how I had been. I agreed to go, I think out of morbid curiosity. I'd never even been to my dad's house. I did want to see where he lived with his real family for 30 years. I wanted to see what could have been my life. It was 50 shades of awful. The grass hadn't been cut all summer. You couldn't get to the front door through the overgrowth. There were three pickup trucks in the yard, two were full of trash. Cabs and beds and back seats, just trash. Mail, clothes, paper, shoes, garbage bags. I couldn't understand it. My dad's handicapped modified SUV was on four flats and full of garbage, too. I didn't have a key, so I just walked around. From what windows I could look through, the inside was in shambles and hoarded to hell. On the front and carport doors were dozens of notices from the city that they were going to condemn the place. The carport was also hoarded. Boxes and boxes stacked on each other, most rotting from the rain. The yard was full of garbage. Broken Christmas ornaments, more shoes, rusted tools, and old toys. There was a letter in the mailbox notifying him that since the house was abandoned, mail would not be delivered anymore. That night, I googled powers of attorney and how to use them. I went back the next day and showed my dad the pictures on my phone. He vowed to beat Shorty's butt, and then asked me to help more. I told him I would, but he'd have to sign power of attorney over to me. If he didn't, he could figure this stuff out by himself. He agreed. So I set about finding a lawyer who would drive to another state and do the paperwork in the nursing home. Bless that lawyer for being so good at his job, because all I did was tell him what I knew, and he put together a beautifully bulletproof POA. It was full of stuff I didn't even know I would need. He also filed the paperwork to revoke Shorty's POA. And now I'm unstoppable. I got to work the next morning. I didn't know how scorched the earth would be when I finished, and I didn't want Shorty or anyone from his prolific, inbred family trying to find me, so I made sure nothing I did had my name on it. I opened a Google account for my dad and got a Google number. I opened a PO box for him in his town. I put in a mail forwarding notice. I pulled his credit report. I took the POA to my dad's small town bank, changed the address on his accounts, and got new account numbers. I requested copies of every transaction back to the day Shanty wife died. I had to go to the main branch, two hours from my house, the next day to pick the records up. I sat in the lobby all afternoon, going through the account. I cornered a service rep and got a crash course in his debits and deposits. This is when I figured out the extent of Shorty's staggering stupidity. My dad got about 5k a month in disability and social security every month. Twice a week, Shorty was going into a branch and withdrawing cash. All of the cash. For 13 months. And every time he did it, as the POA, he had to sign a form stating that he was acting on behalf of my dad, and that form was notarized by the bank. I went through every withdrawal and got the bank to confirm that every one of them was made by Shorty. Then I went to the house and called the locksmith. I knew it was bad, but I had no idea what was waiting for me there. He got the first door open, and the stench rolled out like a fog bank. We both gagged. Two locks later, I was so embarrassed by what he had to see and smell, I gave him a $60 tip. And, with shiny new keys in hand, I called the cops. I told them I was POA for my dad, was checking on his house, and there were three vehicles there that didn't belong to him. He asked me if I knew who they belonged to. I said no, and I wanted them towed. This is the saddest thing you've ever seen. When I was 12 years old my sister, she was 16, she began to experience abdominal pain. She never really told anyone about it except me. We were super close, like inseparable close. She thought that it was just because of her periods. As the months started to grow, so did her pain. 
I was freaked out so I suggested that we tell our mom but she said that she didn't want to burden my parents, we were at a financial loss at that time. So after about 65 days she couldn't hold on so she decided to tell my mom. My mom got an appointment immediately and we rushed to the ER, emergency room. My sister was wailing in pain. The docs over there took an ultrasound scan and then an MRI and a couple of other scans. At this point my mom and I were crying that's when they revealed that my sister had pancreatic cancer and that it had crossed stage 3. My mom literally fainted right there. I was alone and scared and I had heard about cancer only in stories and books like Fault in Our Stars. But when my sister was a victim I didn't know how to react. When my mom regained consciousness and calmed down, they told her that my sister was given a few painkillers and anesthesia for the time being and that we had to start with chemotherapy soon but that they were not sure that it would work. My sister did not know that she had cancer, the doc explained it to her usually merry face broke down. They started chemo and her beautiful black locks which she was proud of slowly began to fall. She was a person of positivity so she told my mom that she wanted to experiment her hair. She had hip length hair which she cut it to a bob then a pixie and then finally shaved her head. We both shaved our heads together. She would never get a minute of sleep at night. On the 12th of December, it was my birthday, I ran home from school happily as my friends had given me a lot of gifts for my sister and me. My dad was there, my mom wasn't, my sister was at the hospital, so I asked my dad to drive me to the hospital as I wanted to give the gifts to my sister. My dad was looking really depressed but he agreed. When I reached my sister's room, she was screaming out of pain my mom was screaming for the docs. I went near my sister slowly she smiled at me even with too much pain. Her last words to me were, I love you, take care of Tiger, our one-year-old dog, and mom and dad, it's time for me to see grandma and grandpa in heaven. She died at 16.07 p.m. on my birthday. I cried for almost a month and I still cry for her every single day but not in front of my parents because I know that if I cry they will cry too. I hope she found a peaceful place. Teacher, have you ever caught your students doing something inappropriate? I teach at a Catholic middle school, so our standards for appropriate behavior are pretty high. Technically, a student telling another student to shut up counts as inappropriate for us and I'd have to discipline that student if I heard it. The most inappropriate thing I've ever caught a student doing, that would be inappropriate even by public school standards, happened about five years ago. I was proctoring a standardized test near the end of the school year. All of the 8th graders had already been accepted into their high schools, and they just didn't care about the standardized test or anything else having to do with school at that point. This particular test session was an hour long, and students were not allowed to read a book or draw or do anything else once they were finished with their tests. The idea is to prevent students from rushing through the test to get back to a book they're reading. The 8th graders rushed through the test anyway, because they just didn't care. One student literally put his name on his paper and turned it in with all of the answers blank. He'd been a discipline problem for the two years I taught him, and I was happy he was about to move on to high school. He turned in his answer sheet before I even sat down from passing out everyone's tests, smiled at me, returned to his seat, and put his head on his desk. I wasn't allowed to say anything to him or encourage him to try harder or anything. He asked if he could sit in an unoccupied corner seat for the rest of the time, and I agreed. I was happy he was taking a nap and wasn't going to distract others, or so I thought. About 15 minutes later, as I was walking around, monitoring everyone else who was still taking the test, I looked in his direction. His head was down and his hoodie was pulled over his head, but there was no mistaking what was going on. He was wearing sweatpants, and his hand was down them. He was playing with himself in the back of the classroom during a standardized test. I didn't want to make a scene, because I didn't want to disturb the students who were focused on the test. I had two options, tell him to stop, and risk him making a scene. Ignore it and tell his parents later. I went with option two. After the test, I emailed the parents and cc'd my boss, explaining exactly what had happened with him not doing the test, and what he did afterwards. The mother apologized. My boss said I did the right thing. The kid didn't look me in the eyes for the next three weeks I taught him. It's the saddest thing you've ever seen. When I was 12 years old my sister, she was 16, she began to experience abdominal pain. She never really told anyone about it except me, we were super close, like inseparable close. She thought that it was just because of her periods. As the months started to grow, so did her pain. I was freaked out so I suggested that we tell our mom but she said that she didn't want to burden my parents, we were at a financial loss at that time. So after about 65 days she couldn't hold on so she decided to tell my mom. My mom got an appointment immediately and we rushed to the ER, emergency room. My sister was wailing in pain. The docs over there took an ultrasound scan and then an MRI and a couple of other scans. At this point my mom and I were crying that's when they revealed that my sister had pancreatic cancer and that it had crossed stage 3. My mom literally fainted right there. I was alone and scared and I had heard about cancer only in stories and books like Fault in Our Stars. But when my sister was a victim I didn't know how to react. When my mom regained consciousness and calmed down, they told her that my sister was given a few painkillers and anesthesia for the time being and that we had to start with chemotherapy soon but that they were not sure that it would work. My sister did not know that she had cancer, the doc explained it to her usually merry face broke down. They started chemo and her beautiful black locks which she was proud of slowly began to fall. She was a person of positivity so she told my mom that she wanted to experiment her hair. She had hip length hair which she cut it to a bob then a pixie and then finally shaved her head. We both shaved our heads together. She would never get a minute of sleep at night. On the 12th of December, it was my birthday, I ran home from school happily as my friends had given me a lot of gifts for my sister and me. My dad was there, my mom wasn't, my sister was at the hospital, 
So I asked my dad to drive me to the hospital as I wanted to give the gifts to my sister. My dad was looking really depressed but he agreed. When I reached my sister's room, she was screaming out of pain my mom was screaming for the docs. I went near my sister slowly she smiled at me even with too much pain. Her last words to me were, I love you, take care of Tiger, our one-year-old dog, and mom and dad, it's time for me to see grandma and grandpa in heaven. She died at 16.07 p.m. on my birthday. I cried for almost a month and I still cry for her every single day but not in front of my parents because I know that if I cry they will cry too. I hope she found a peaceful place. My husband is upset that I gave him permission to sleep with my best friend. So about four months ago, my husband and my best friend of over 10 years sat me down and told me that they were very attracted to each other. My best friend is very beautiful and she is single and to be honest she has more in common with my husband than I do. Both are positive and energetic with a great sense of humor. That's why I love them. But more than getting along and being cordial to one another I have never seen them being flirtatious to one another and they always treated each other with respect so hearing what they had to say shocked me to my core. My husband insisted that he loved me and that it was nothing more than physical attraction. They didn't want to do anything behind my back so they were basically asking for permission to sleep together. I think that they truly believed that if they told me it wouldn't be considered cheating and it would be easier on their conscience I guess. I was shocked as I mentioned and started crying and my best friend got very worried and started apologizing and crying too telling me how she would never do anything that I didn't agree on or that would jeopardize our friendship and she left quickly afterwards after apologizing a million times, texted me apologies all night too. I just packed my bags and went to live with my father and his family with my two babies. It became very clear to me very soon that I acted very rash and only on my emotions and my father didn't really show any interest in housing me for a longer period. I started regretting leaving. My husband was calling me every day telling me that he loved me and that he would never do anything behind my back or cheat on me when I asked him if they had an affair. Anyway after three weeks at my father's I started discussing my husband's wish with him and I finally agreed. He was very glad and he reassured me that it was just physical and that both he and my best friend weren't interested in anything else but to be honest, by then I didn't even care, I just wanted to go home. I thought that neither my husband nor my best friend were worth me destroying my children's chance to a whole and safe home being a child of divorce myself. My best friend called me to make sure that my husband was telling her the truth, I want to hear it from you, are you sure, are you 100% sure I said yes. All I know is that they have slept together, I didn't want any details. I don't know the when, I guess it was right after I moved back home if they weren't already sleeping together. I don't know the where, probably at her place since she lives alone, and I don't know the how often or if they still are doing it. At first my husband was cheerful but after a while he started getting depressed. He complained that I have changed and that he missed me and he wanted to discuss things with me but I wasn't interested. I told him that I was giving him an unlimited pass if it meant he never talked to me about this again but it made him more depressed. Now he started flat out blaming me for the change in our relationship. He said that I tricked him. I could have said no because then he would not have done it if it was to affect our relationship but instead I ran away and now I'm changed. He also said that I have cut contact with my friend even after I gave her the green light. If she knew the price was me never wanting to talk to her again she would never have done it so now she thinks I ruined our friendship that she cherished more than anything. I have tricked them. I have tricked him and now I haven't even looked him in the face in 4 months. I asked him what he wanted from me now, because I truly believe that I've done all in my power to please him. Divorce? Maybe just separation? I suggested that he should see someone regarding of his depressed state of mind but he just shook his head told me that I didn't get it. I don't know what I'm supposed to get. I did what he wanted and I have accepted this and our current life is my lemonade. My babies have a stable home and I am well cared for. I want to help my husband yes but not to the extent that it would affect me or my children. Any advice? Please nothing about divorce because I don't want that and neither does my husband. Edit, okay, everyone is telling me that this is fake and I'm a troll. I'm sorry to have bothered you. I really thought people were more helpful. I will not bother you. This is the most inappropriate thing a teacher has ever done in class. Well not really a teacher, but my principal. My high school had a strict policy on cell phones. Every morning we were expected to turn them into a basket in the office, and we couldn't get them back until after the, the afternoon announcements. During the last week of my junior year, I had a religion final. I usually kept my phone hidden in my locker, but that day I had totally forgotten about the exam and had left it in my bag. We were almost out of time for the exam, about 15 minutes left, when someone's phone went off. Everyone instantly looked at me since they knew I liked to keep my phone on me, but it wasn't. I usually turned it off to save battery. The classroom was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. Miss C slowly stood up, looked around the room and then walked into the hallway to call the office. I took this moment to rummage through my bag, find my phone powered off, and hide it in a thick folder. When she came back, she told everyone to stay behind so we could sort it out. The last 15 minutes of that final went by agonizingly slow. My heart was beating out of my chest as I tried to finish the short essay section. It wasn't my phone, 
So whose could it have been? What if my phone made some kind of noise because it had died? What if she finds my phone and I fail? I had never gotten a detention or bad grade because I was that student. All the teachers liked me. When afternoon announcements came on over the loudspeaker, I almost slouched with relief, but then the principal's voice came on and started speaking to us. Students in room L1, stay in your seats until further notice. A few minutes later, the principal's secretary came to our door. She made all of us line up single file, none of us were allowed to leave the room until she went through each and every one of our bags. She then instructed us to walk to my teacher and turn our pockets inside out to prove we didn't have any electronics. Mind you, this is only a religion final that the teacher made up, not even a state exam or anything that would really stop us from passing. There was another kid in my class named Nick who also carried his phone around a lot, among other forbidden things. He was a well-known by all the teachers in the school and also the local law enforcement. So me and Nick stood waiting at the back of the line. Was it you? My phone is turned off. Nick I swear to God if I get penalized for this. He shrugged and jumped in line ahead of me. We stood there for at least 40 minutes waiting for each person ahead of us to get cleared. When it was Nick's turn, I instantly knew it was him. He slowly took everything out of his bag as if trying to delay the inevitable. His bag ended up passing, but then the teacher checked his desk. Lo and behold, there was his cracked Samsung with a missed call. The teacher and secretary both walked him to the office and I was free to go home. But this isn't the end of it. As I walked upstairs to the main entrance, there was a group of boys standing outside the principal's door talking to Ms. C. Shit. I tried to speed walk to the door but not even 15 feet outside I hear my name. Sadie, come here. I crossed my fingers and hoped she would just tell me to not bring my phone to class and to not hang out with Nick, but she pulled me into a classroom. She then proceeded to go through each and every one of my folders until she found my phone. I was mortified, she was invading my privacy. What gives her the right to be able to just go through my stuff like that? My anxiety got the best of me and I finally burst into tears. I'm sorry, I forgot the final was today. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She told me she was giving my phone to the principal and I wouldn't get it back until further notice. Later that afternoon, my mom got a phone call from the principal. I don't know what exactly was exchanged, but I know my mom was on my side. She reassured me that my teacher said she wouldn't penalize my grade but the principal wanted to keep my phone for the whole. Summer. I was livid, to say the least. My dad was also very angry that my teacher, the secretary and the principal had violated my privacy, and he agreed I couldn't go a whole summer without my phone. I had a job, friends, and most importantly I had bought and maintained the phone with my own money. My dad told my mom to go to the office the next day and demand that they give me back my personal property. The one time I was thankful that my dad had a temper. What is the most disgusting thing you have ever done that you took pleasure in? My wife and I had two wonderful daughters, 13 and 10, and a pretty healthy relationship. At some point things started to appear off. She got very clingy to her phone all of a sudden, made sure to delete the saved password feature on our common PC, stated having phone calls that suddenly ended when I came into the room. You can probably guess what it was. Now having 15 years of marriage behind us, I was hoping it wasn't what it obviously seemed to be. So one day when she told me she was going to spend some time with the girls I decided to follow her. Sure enough, I find her driving to a hotel to meet with a guy I will call Steve. To say it was a gut punch was an understatement. I literally cried for an hour straight. After I was done with my self-wallowing phase, I decided the best course was getting even. I thought of several scenarios that may or may not have involved me hurting Steve. Eventually I decided to do things more civilly and more importantly legally, but only just. So the first part of the plan was gathering evidence. I could have just gotten a pie, but I had something better in mind. So one day when my wife was at her job and the kids at school, I installed some small secret cameras and microphones I had bought. Due to the setup of our bedroom I even managed to get one perfectly overlooking the bed. I didn't however use them while I was at home. So a couple of days pass, when I proposed to my wife that the second to next weekend I should take the girls on a trip and stay a night too. I more often than not was the one cooking, I took a far more active role in raising the girls and showed them a lot more patience and attention. She was usually busy working or drinking, so me going alone with the girls on a trip wasn't that weird. So two weeks pass, in which time I get my affairs in order and contact a lawyer to write up a separation agreement that would involve me keeping residence in custody. I go on the trip, try to not give anything away to the girls and wait and see if Steve and my wife fall into the trap. When I returned I checked the recordings of the weekend, and sure enough it's a 36-hour fest. When they weren't doing the deed the dialogue was something even better. I found out that Steve had a wife, but even worse they also talked about me. And I heard the obvious character assassination that I expected about how small my PP was, an insecurity of mine, how I didn't satisfy her, but there was some really hurtful stuff, like her telling Steve some of my deepest secrets and shameful stories that I had only told her about, just so they could have a laugh. She even told him about my dope story and how I attempted to take my life when I was 16. So at this point I didn't have any doubts on what to do. The next day when the kids left, but before my wife left, I confronted her with the video and told her that either she signs the separation agreement and leaves the house or the girls are going to receive an in-depth explanation of all the positions in which mommy cheated on daddy. I wasn't gonna do that, just to be clear, I love my daughters too much, but I put the threat there and she was too emotional to realize my bluff. She went through all the stages, denying everything, trying to bargain, threatening me, and getting angry. 
I let it go through all that stuff. Eventually she signed the paper and she departed that very evening after she told her goodbyes to the girls. I didn't show or tell the girls anything graphic. I was always very honest with them, which is another reason why I was always the favorite parent, so I just said that mommy had been unfaithful. The younger took some time figuring it out, but that was made up by my older getting mightily upset. She had just gotten her first boyfriend as I'm not sure the term really applies at that age, but she knew enough of the world to get mad big time. This would be important that it would be custody battle, as though she did for the moment agree to give over custody I feared, and I was right to fear, that she would try and fight me for the kids. What I didn't expect was for her to use her visitation rights to talk crap about me. Basically she started telling my younger kid about how it was all my fault for not forgiving her. Her lawyer even started demanding she receive custody. So I finally activated my revenge plan, and her trip to South Carolina. Why South Carolina? Simple. Fort Sumter. I really wanted my daughters to see it. I definitely did not go there because it is one of the last places where revenge corn isn't illegal, and where I could upload my wife and Steve's doings and intimate moments with no worries on the internet and other such sites as you cannot be prosecuted for crimes that weren't illegal when and where they were committed. I especially made sure to include the clip where Steve could not get it up. I sent the links to my wife's employer, her clients, and everybody in her line of work just to be sure, to Steve's wife and to his firm. Steve soon got a divorce. I feel sorry for his wife as she was an innocent victim in all of this, but I think it's better that she found out. As for my wife, this was the end of any chance to get custody. She soon got fired from her job of 8 years. I got custody. Yes, due to her being unemployed, I got no alimony, but honestly I make enough money to sustain both me and the girls, so I don't care and I'm good enough at caring for them and they are old enough to allow me to have a full-time job. Several months later, my wife is still unemployed. Last time I spoke to her wife she threatened to come and take my life and how this will be revenge for ruining hers. It's the most disgusting intimate experience you've had. Several years ago, seeing a local girl and she's at my place, lovely evening moves on to some light kissing, some touching, and pretty soon we're naked, I'm lying back on my bed, she's down using her mouth on me. Now being the gentleman that I am, I am focused on holding in a fart, I could leave and head to the bathroom, but she's seriously good so, I'm just putting all my energy on keeping that fart inside me. Nothing too difficult, I can handle this if I keep my attention away from how great her mouth feels and focus on keeping my cheeks shut. After a while of fantastic tongue action, she looks up at me from between my legs and says, don't worry. Now up until now I hadn't been worried at all. I was enjoying this evening, I was fully aware of the situation, and I had absolutely no cause to worry about anything. But, now she'd told me not to worry, I started worrying, I started worrying a lot. What was she into? Now, what I would like to say happened next is this, she gently eased a very well lubricated thumb in the back passage, while keeping me in her mouth, and treated me with care and dignity. That did not happen, this happened. She said don't worry, I started worrying, and then within a second, she rammed it. Deep and dry, it felt like sandpaper being parted by a cheese grater. The shock of having a thumb in me with the force of a thousand suns caused several things to happen. One I screamed, two I half sat up, and third and possibly worst, I released the fart I was holding. Which was not, as she suddenly discovered, a dry one. Her thumb was fully in me and I released my clenched sphincter to allow the deep rumbling liquid hell forth. Picture what happens to the water when you put your thumb over the end of a hose pipe and spray it into the air, then replace water with shark, hose pipe with my arse, and the air with her face. She, understandably, jerked hard backward from the brown spray, however in doing this, she pulled her thumb straight back out of me, I clenched harder than a camel's eye in a sandstorm, and then for some reason. Finished. She screamed, and ran to the bathroom and turned the shower on. I fell back onto my pillow smelling of sweat, SHT and nut. We don't talk anymore. It's a mistake that cost you everything. I banged my first cousin while she was sleeping. I've been trying to process this whole misunderstanding, but I honestly don't know where to begin. Before I ask for your advice, I need to give you the full story. My girlfriend and I went out for drinks and met up with my younger cousin. The three of us had hung out once before and had a blast. My cousin brought a couple of her friends, and we hopped from bar to bar. I ended up having a few too many, but I wasn't completely wasted. By the end of the night, my cousin also had a bit too much to drink. Since my girlfriend was our designated driver, we offered to let my cousin crash in our spare room. I thought to myself, who's safer than family, right? We got home, and my girlfriend decided to take a shower, leaving me alone in the living room. My cousin went to the spare room and changed into one of my girlfriend's oversized t-shirts before climbing into bed. As I lay down on the couch, the alcohol started to hit me even harder. The room seemed to sway, and my senses were heightened. I wasn't having a bad time, but the intensity of the alcohol's effects made me feel a surge of desire. I stumbled into our bedroom, feeling the weight of the alcohol pulling me down. The room seemed to spin as I removed my clothes and crawled into bed, trying to focus on the familiar shape of my girlfriend lying next to me. In my drunken state, I failed to realize that I had actually walked into the spare room where my cousin was sleeping. My girlfriend and I had a playful, intimate routine that we'd often engage in before falling asleep. Believing that I was in bed with my girlfriend, I started to caress the figure beside me, gently kissing her neck. She stirred in her sleep but didn't wake, and I took that as an encouragement to continue. Before I knew it, things had escalated, and I found myself making love to my sleeping cousin who I thought was my girlfriend. It wasn't until the next morning that I realized my terrible mistake. I woke up to find my cousin staring at me, her eyes. Filled with confusion and hurt. 
In my drunken state, I had entered the wrong room and the wrong girl. Panicked, I rushed to my room and found my girlfriend, who had been waiting for me the whole night. Her eyes narrowed as she demanded an explanation. I couldn't hold back the tears as I confessed everything to her, choking on the words as I told her about the awful mistake I had made. How could you? She whispered, her voice trembling. I trusted you, and you betrayed me. With your cousin, of all people. I'm so, so sorry, I stammered, the guilt weighing heavily on me. I was drunk, and I didn't realize. I thought it was you. That doesn't make it any better, she snapped, her eyes filling with tears. I don't know if I can ever forgive you for this. My cousin, who had been listening to our conversation from the doorway, stepped into the room. Her face was a mix of sadness and anger. I wish I could say it didn't happen, but it did, she said, her voice barely audible. I'm sorry, too. With that, my cousin packed her things and left the apartment, the door closing behind her with a heavy thud. My girlfriend looked at me one last time, her eyes filled with pain and disappointment. I can't stay here, she said, grabbing her keys and walking out the door, leaving me alone to face the consequences of my actions. Now, all I can hope for is that this mess doesn't get out to the rest of my family because I'd probably implode. The relationship between my cousin and me has been irreparably damaged, and my girlfriend may never forgive me. Even though it was a horrible mistake, the reality of our actions has hit us hard. Will I ever be able to make things right, or is it too far gone for any of us to heal?